So I went to the Netherlands this summer, got a really cool mug from Amsterdam, learned a lot of stuff too. I was over there ostensibly learning about the history of the Dutch Republic and trade and the modern economy and all of that kind of stuff. So I want to do a lecture series on the history of the Dutch Republic. And I'm going to start that lecture series by answering what might seem to be a very simple question, but it's not. And that question is, what is a stadtholder? Who is this guy that keeps coming up in the history of the Dutch Republic? And what does this title mean? It seems nebulous and all of that kind of stuff seems complex. Who is he? What did this person do? That's the question that I want to answer, first of all, in this lecture series on the history of the Dutch Republic. So what is a stadtholder? Now, first of all, let's start with the word stadtholder. This comes from a Dutch word, stadhouder. How's my Dutch? Now, stadhouder means placeholder in the sense that someone is standing in place of or instead of. Now, keep in mind that the Dutch language is almost like the German language and the English language got together and had an illegitimate child or something like that. And that illegitimate child is Dutch. Not to say that Dutch is illegitimate. I love the language, okay? And so the stadtholder is a placeholder. And really, part of why this word seems so nebulous and so hard to comprehend is it doesn't always mean the same thing all the time. The stadtholdership really goes through three phases, and those three phases, the three R's, all right, sounds nice and teacherly and easy to remember, a royal steward, a rebel leader, and a Republican head of state. So the stadtholder starts off as a steward. Now, when I think steward, I think Lord of the Rings. Great little story here, all right? Because I was going through a flea market when I was in Amsterdam, and all of a sudden, I zoomed in on, wah, in de van van der Ring, or der Ring, der Ring. I guess that you would say it like that, okay? Because the Dutch, when they see a G, they're like, something like that, all right? But this is the Fellowship of the Ring in Dutch. Now, unfortunately, I have no idea what any of this stuff says, but that's Mordor. It's the same in Dutch. But I'm so excited to have this book that I can't read. Y'all know how much I love Lord of the Rings. But anyway, as far as the steward goes, this is the person who is there instead of a higher lord who would have the nominal right to that territory. So the stadtholder would govern these territories as a representative of higher absentee nobles. And in the 15th and 16th century, the Netherlands was ruled by the Habsburg emperors. And the Habsburg emperors would appoint stadtholders. And William of Orange was appointed as stadtholder of Holland, Zeeland, and Utrecht. And what we have here is a case of the stadtholder after some reluctant self-reflection, becoming the leader of the rebellion against his lord. So William of Orange, the stadtholder, becomes the leader of the Dutch revolt. And so now the stadtholdership goes from being the royal steward to the rebel general. That now William of Orange is George Washington. William of Orange is Robert E. Lee. So William of Orange is the stadtholder of Holland, Zeeland, and Utrecht. And the thing is that now, as a confederation, now keep in mind that the Dutch Republic was not a nation. It was not a unitary government. Each province appointed its own stadtholder. So he wasn't stadtholder of the Netherlands or anything like that. So the states of Holland would appoint their own stadtholder, and hopefully enough people would agree so that there was a bit of unity. So William of Orange was the stadtholder also of Friesland, ends up appointing him as a stadtholder as well. So there are four provinces that end up appointing William of Orange as their stadtholder. But as a confederation, several provinces would often appoint the same stadtholder. But then again, if you look at 1625, you see that sometimes provinces named different stadtholders, typically descendants of William of Orange, but you'll have one stadtholder in Holland, Zeeland, and Utrecht. 
and in this case, uh, Helderland, and then Overijssel and Drenthe and Friesland have their own stadholder. So you have two different stadholders. That's okay because each province appoints their stadholder. So what is a stadholder? Now, what's funny about this is one of the best sources we have about the stadholdership is James Madison's Notes on Ancient and Modern Confederacies. James Madison wrote this when he was preparing for the Constitutional Convention. And he writes these notes really based on a lot of European scholarship. This isn't actually original scholarship on Madison's part, but he's making notes about all of these texts he's reading because he wants to find out what were the strong points of previous confederations and what were the defects. So as he's going through, he's looking at Sir William Temple. He's looking at Charles Joseph Pankauk or Pankoka or whatever, okay, something like that. Sorry for you pronunciation snobs. And Hugo Grotius, who was actually a Dutch scholar. And so Madison's observations are based on his readings of these European philosophers, in many cases books that Thomas Jefferson had sent him from Europe. So let's go into the civil powers of the stadholder as head of states. Now notice I'm not saying head of state because the Dutch Republic wasn't a state, so to speak, as much as a confederation of provinces and states. There are eight powers that Madison identifies as belonging to the stadholder. First of all, the power to settle differences between provinces. Second, to recommend and influence the appointment of ambassadors. Third, to be an ex officio member of the Council of State. Four, to preside in the provincial courts of justice where his name is prefixed to all public acts. Five, the supreme curator of most of the universities. Six, to appoint town magistrates. Seven, to give audiences to ambassadors. And eight, the power of pardon. Now, a lot of these powers sound a lot like the powers of the President of the United States or most heads of state today. Now, also, the stadholder tended to be the Captain General, the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. Keep in mind that this didn't automatically come with the stadholdership, but was typically conferred upon the stadholder. Whoever held that office would also hold the office of Captain General and of Admiral General, the head of the Navy, so he could control all of the armed forces and pretty much lead the rebel army, so to speak, and rebel navy. Now, the stadholdership was a republican institution, meaning that this was not a king. This was not hereditary. This wasn't something that automatically passed to his son. This was not something that was permanent. It wasn't institutionalized until very late in the republic. Now, William of Orange was the model stadholder. When you go to the Netherlands, everyone knows about Willem van Aranya. He's a national hero. He's the father of their country. Before this, nobody really would have thought of a Dutch nation or anything like that, of the Netherlands as being its own thing. So really, the father of their country. And according to an outside observer, an Englishman who was visiting Delft, I had the privilege of visiting Willem van Aranya's house at the Prinzenhof in Delft. And I read this thing that really struck me as very small r Republican, so to speak, where this English observer said his clothes look like those of a humble student. His jacket is a knitted sweater like those worn by one of our ferrymen. His friends are citizens of this beer-brewing city of Delft. And he fits in perfectly. So although he is a high noble from this important house, he realizes how to get along in a republic, and he's able to make himself into this republican sort of figure, which is part of the reason why people loved him so much. And this is really illustrated well at this kind of copy of Willem von Aranya's grave at the Prinzenhof, you can see that he's lying down. He's got his fancy little kind of whatever they put around their necks there. And then you see that he's sort of in some sort of sleeping cap. And then at his feet, a dog. All right? That, you know, it's like, hey, I'm just lying down with my dog. You know, I'm not just some high nobleman or something like that. I'm one of you. All right? I'm just a guy that takes a nap with his dog. When you look at Dutch R from this period. Dogs are all over the place, but I just thought that was really cool. He's just got that dog at his feet. Just seems like such a normal guy. 
Now, as much as William of Orange might have projected Republican simplicity, that wasn't necessarily the case with stadtholders that followed him. In a lot of cases, the pretensions of the office and the trappings of the court and all of that kind of stuff, that they would become more elevated over time, as things often do. And the House of Orange Nassau typically held the stadtholdership that all or nearly all of the Republican stadtholders were descendants of William of Orange. And this presents a bit of a problem when you look at the history of the Dutch Republic, that the Republic's constitution presented some contradictions. Because on one hand, you've got a federal republic, which really is a lot like the young United States. It's going to come along later. But the figurehead is a semi-hereditary noble. Now, nominally elected, but at the same time, all coming from the same noble house and all of that kind of stuff. So is it a republic? Is it a monarchy? Is it somewhere in between? Keep in mind that this is a government that was cobbled together during a rebellion, that they weren't necessarily starting from scratch. They were starting with what they had. But the House of Orange is a very prominent feature in the Dutch Republic, and it's a bit of a contradiction. James Madison is reflecting possibly through someone else, but saying that this is a strange effect of human contradictions. Men too jealous to confide their liberty to their representatives who are their equals abandoned it to a prince who might the more easily abuse it. To somebody like Madison, it seems a little weird that they would let a hereditary nobleman be their figurehead, but seemed to work for them. Now, there were some people that didn't like the influence of the House of Orange, people who wanted a less centralized government. And so you had conflicts between the Orangists and people who wanted to see more of a role for the states. Now, I plan to do another lecture on this topic, and when I do, I'll put a little card or some kind of link there so that you can access it. So the Orangists and the states are often going after each other, but the thing is that this republic being in the midst of all of these European monarchies, these much stronger states, that it's very difficult, as Madison said, that it's certain that so many independent core and interests could not be kept together without such a center of union as the stadtholdership. That the stadtholdership is the glue that keeps this thing together. Now, they tried a few stadtholderless periods, these people who wanted the states to have more influence and did not want this central unifying figure of the stadtholder. But every time, they brought the stadtholder back. Madison, citing William Temple, wrote that in the intermission of the stadtholdership, Holland, by her riches and authority, drew the others into a sort of dependence. So typically, this movement to reduce the influence of the House of Orange was driven by the Hollanders, because the Hollanders had more money, they controlled trade, Amsterdam is there, and all of that kind of stuff. So Holland liked this sort of arrangement because they got to call the shots. Now people in the other provinces, they tended to prefer the Oranges, because the Oranges would unite everyone and keep Holland from running the show. With such a government, the Union never could have subsisted if, in effect, the provinces had not within themselves a spring capable of quickening their tardiness and impelling them to the same way of thinking. This spring is the stadtholder. So in 1754, really, the Orangists end up winning this thing, and the stadtholdership is institutionalized, that a hereditary stadtholder general is established in the late Dutch Republic. So you have William IV and William V, but alas, it does not last forever, because in 1795, enter Napoleon, and that is the end of that. And William V runs off to Britain in exile. Now, of course, that's not the end of the House of Orange. The current king of the Netherlands is of the House of Orange. So they haven't gone anywhere. You see where they've got those orange flowers and those oranges, which kind of ironically, oranges in Dutch are not referred to as aranya, like the color, but they're referred to as sinus apples. So he's got aranya flowers and sinus apples. Go figure. So what is the stadtholder? It's pretty complicated, but it was an important unifying figure in the Dutch Republic, a royal steward, a rebel leader, and 
a Republican head of state. And this person unified a republic that might not otherwise have been able to exist. Hopefully you learned a little something, and I hope to continue some more lectures on the history of the Dutch Republic. So if you want to see those, be sure to subscribe. TomRitchie.net, my website, Twitter, Instagram, all of that kind of stuff. Find me on Facebook. I'll be back with some more lectures soon. Until next time.